Welcome back, Farmer's Corner. Today is the 10th of March, Wednesday, the 10th of March, 2021. First video of the day. So, today I'm going to talk about an issue, and I think I have touched on this issue, but a, a friend of mine called and was like, Mitchell, why are you advocating? Let me have my, my notebook here so I don't miss anything. Why are you advocating for the red line to, to be removed? Why? He asked me two things. He said, why am I advocating for the red line to be removed? Why am I against state-owned land? Let's start off with the red line. Oh, let me start off with state-owned land first. Why I am against state-owned land, I look, I look at state-owned land as poverty traps. What, by, what I mean by that is, when you... Okay, there are communal land also this side. Let me not just talk about the north, but there are also communal lands this side. You're talking about Ochinene, Ochituo, Ochim, Ochimbingwe, Cobles, all these places. These are all communal areas, and some in the south that I'm not really, might not be per, pervy to. The problem with state-owned land, which was, which is, of course, owned and administrated by the government, is a poverty trap. What do I mean by this? You can have, let's say, 700 hectares on, on the communal, in a communal area of, let's say, Ochinene, or let's say the Zambezuri, let's say the Kavango, any communal area. You can't go to the bank and use that piece of land that you have, that 700 hectares, as collateral in the bank. Because you don't own it. Firstly, you don't own it. It's, you, don't have, you don't have a title deed to it. You don't have proof of ownership of it. Probably you register it. You've registered it. But you don't own it. There is no title deed as what you would get when you own a private piece of, of land, when you buy a farm or you buy a plot. You get a, private, a title deed that says, this year a farm measuring 700 hectares belongs to Mitchell Simata and uh, yeah this is proof that this thing belongs to him and, I, and I, if I have a commercial farm I can take that title deed and go to any commercial bank whether Standard Bank, Bank Vinduk, Net Bank, uh, FNB, uh, FNB and, and even Development Bank or the Agricultural Bank and put that down as collateral to say I have this farm and apply for a loan probably to buy farming implementations, uh, tractors, uh, tractors, uh, pl plowing implementations, or I want to buy a brand new bull, or I want to buy a tractor, or I want to buy a truck to be able to transport and bring animals to and from my farm. And because I have that title deed, the bank would be more friendlier towards me in terms of me being able to apply for, for, for loans and being able to successfully obtain these loans because I have collateral. Now, when you have this state-owned land, as I said, which is government-owned land, you don't have that luxury. If you go to any commercial bank or the agricultural bank and you want to apply for a loan using your communal area, they don't accept that. Because as I said, you don't own it. It's, it's administrated by the government through the various traditional authorities, whatever traditional royal house is there. So you don't own it. Secondly, why I also say that this um, state-owned land thing is a poverty trap is this. If you take it upon yourself and say, I want to start a project. I want to start a fish farm, for example, in, co in a communal area. You identify a piece of land, you hire the trucks, the tractors, the gretters, and you guys come dig a pond and you fill it up. And you filled up that pond, you've put in fish in that pond. Now you've started your fish farm. Because you don't own the land, you will find people entering there and catching fish and bringing their cattle to drink water in that to, 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 to drink, to have a drink from your lake. Imagine, mind you, you are the only person who has spent money on creating that lake. They come, they come, uh, they come and the animals come and uh, drink from that lake. But you spend money alone. And when you say, guys, it is not fair. I took money out of my pocket and I built that and i mean I, I i took money out of my pocket i hired a company to come build that lake now you people are busy using it for the communal for the area's consumption the first thing most of them will tell you my brother this is communal land you don't own this and then if you decide to fence it off they run to the government they run to the ministry whether it's the minister of agriculture they run to the minister of urban and lands and uh, uh the minister of urbanization i oh, know now they just go to the minister of agriculture and lands because it's now one ministry they go report you there, the Minister of Agriculture and, and Lands tell you, listen, Mitchell, they send you a summon telling you to remove that fence and you can't, you, you are not allowed to be fencing off, you're not allowed to be fencing off that lake. Even though you spent money, one man, one man. That state-owned land story breaks my heart because what is on the surface, if you are using this land to plow, 
you, you only own the crops you put into the ground. That's all you own. You own the cattle you put, you, you, you herding there. That's all you own. You don't own the surface. You don't own the surface area where your cattle, where you are plowing or where your cattle are moving about. If let's say they find minerals, let's say they find oil on the field that you plow, what they will do is, I don't even think you will obtain compensation. You are moved. They move you from that uh, piece, piece, uh, uh, field that you have been plowing for the last hundreds of years, probably your father, your grandfather, his grandfather before him, plowed that area. They'll just move you. That's what happened with some of these green schemes up in the um, northern communal areas. People were moved from that areas, from the ancestral land, so, so these green schemes can be established. But I don't think these people are compensated. And I do not think they'll compensate you because they will hit you with the articles that say that state-owned land is administrated and governed by the, by, the, by the government and is owned by the government. You have no ownership over this. If you want to own something, go buy a farm. And that's the problem. If I have a commercial farm, if I have a commercial farm and they find a mineral, let's say they find gold or diamonds on my farm, I am entitled to 50% of whatever they find on that farm because it's my farm, you know? I'm entitled to sell it to them, almost what happened to the B2 gold um, mine that was opened on one of the gentleman's farms. They're entitled, they get paid out. But on a, co on a communal piece of land or a state-owned land, you do not own it. It's not yours. You can't come here and be like, ah, you found oil here in my field. I want 50% of the uh, capital you're going to make of that oil. You can't do that. They will tell you, no, we're not going to do that. We are dealing directly with your government. You, you are, you are a non-starter. So that's the why, why I do not like this um, state-owned land. And I believe it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a poverty trap. I believe, such as what we're talking about, people who have been farming in a particular area for the last hundreds of years need to be given ownership and need to be given title deeds to those lands. So these people can become financi financiable. Let me put it like that. To become financiable in terms of being able to obtain loans, being able to obtain uh, funds to do whatever agricultural projects, whether they want to plant, whether they want to buy cattle, or whether they want to build a house. Because it doesn't matter. Even continue on that state-owned land. You can build a, a, a castle, literally a castle, in your communal area, in your village. But you can't even take that house and put it down as collateral at the bank and say, I built a 25-bedroom house at my village. The bank will tell you, my brother, it's communal land. That, 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 that house equals to, to zero. That field equals to zero. And this is why, even as I speak right now myself, uh, my family, amongst ourselves, my dad, my father, amongst him and myself, we have about 50, 50 plus hectares. But I can't obtain a loan. I can't even get a loan to buy a simple bucky or even just buy a small two by four tractor. I literally have to either take from pensions or have to have to take from savings. Or I have to use something else to put down as collateral. Or I have to use my parents' uh, townhouse, which they built in Vindu. This one where I, where in this place where I find myself recording this. I'll have to use this as collateral to obtain a loan from a bank. To be able to buy cattle, to be able to buy a tractor, to be able to buy a truck, to be able to just when I get involved in agriculture, I'll have to use this as collateral. I can't use anything in the communal area, in the state-owned land. So that's why I feel like this state-owned land is one of the biggest creators of poverty. Because... We are living on land we don't own. We are living on a surface we don't have any rights to. We have no, we have no ownership over it. And this is what causes some tensions within some areas where you would see that people are busy fighting amongst themselves for this piece of, uh, for this piece of plowing land to this piece of plowing land. Because on the end of the day, when you say, when, I, when you come and say, you, this uh, field here, was my grandfather's field. Who gave you the right to plow it? Some of them just hit you with, my brother, this is state-owned. You don't own this land. I can come plow here as long as I am following the right procedures. And this is what leads to a lot of this uh, tradition, I mean, tribal skirmishes that happen in the region where I hail from, the Zambezi region, where you have people arguing and almost coming to blows over land. Because I, 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 can, I can fence it off. I can plow for it. I can, I can fence it off. But... It depends how the people are. If people are good in your area, they'll be like, it's fine, you can fence off your fields. But if they're not, the first thing they'll do, they'll run to the newspaper, they'll run to the ministry, and they would report you and have you remove and have you remove that fence. It has happened on so many uh, cases in this country. And mind you, not everybody will own a commercial farm. A lot of us will have to farm on those communal areas. But unfortunately, as I said, we do not own them. We can register them, but we don't own them. We can't make any... We can make 
money off what we are planting on the surface, but I can't make money from selling it. And this is why when I was at the conference and people were talking about, but yeah, I bought a, a communal area for 65,000. I was telling him, how do you buy communal land? You can't buy communal land. It is actually illegal in the Namibian constitution, any Namibian law, it's illegal to buy and sell, to the buying and selling of communal areas. The second one is why should the red line be removed? This red line issue has been an issue that has existed in Namibia for the longest time. It was started with, with the Germans when they arrived in this country. It was started to, 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 to combat the render pest back, back in the day. There was the render pest that almost nearly wiped out the entire cattle population here in Namibia and Southwest Africa, as it was known back in the day. So they established the red line as a way to protect the livestock this side from the livestock that side. It was started. And that was the first reason. So it was a scientific reason why it was set up. The second reason it was set up is a method to oppress people. Because first you create, first you set up this red line to prevent the, the parasite. But when what's the second, the parasite has been fought, medicine, uh, medicine was created, medical research was created to fight the render pest illnesses, but the red line was still kept there. Why? The first reason was political. Because you had big populations up there, you had Going back to history, yeah, the Ovambo people who were, who were trading with the Portuguese, so these people had modern-day weapons and were strong, and they were not just small, few clusters here and there. It was a strong Ovambo kingdom. You had the same with my people in the Zambezi region who were, trade, who were trading, and, 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 and not just that, were administrated by the British back in the day. So they created that red line as there was the first official border back in the day, if you read your history books. So it was, there was a political reason. When the British, the Portuguese, they, when they negotiated with the British and the Portuguese, they finally created Namibia as it's known today of the arms strip. The red line was kept there. Because now these German settlers have arrived in Sudwest, as they would call it, Sudwest, Southwest Africa. They do not have labor. They need labor. They need to get labor. I don't know where they're going to get it, but they need labor. So what do they do? Leave that red line there. Make sure those people don't own that land there. Make sure those people can't make money off their cattle there. They're going to come this side looking for work. This is how a lot of our, a lot of our ancestors, a lot of our uncles, a lot of our grandparents, whenever we would visit them, they would tell us stories of how they were farming or how they used to work. My grandfather, mind you, used to work in a farm in Grootfontein. And he was a very good farm worker. That man gifted him Afrikaner bulls and also gifted him a car. So... That red line was set up there as to create unskilled labor, to force the natives, the native Africans, us, the black people, from our traditional homes to come this side, to come work either in mines, textiles, uh, mines, textiles, and farms. Those are the three jobs where our people were found. My grandfather was a farm worker in the Grootfontein area, and this is something that I can say. He was a farm worker, he was a miner. My grandfather from my mother's side was also a farm and a miner. His brothers were miners. They went as far as working in mines in South Africa. So the South African economy, part of it was built off the backs and sweats of my, of my grandparents. So a South African cannot tell me anything. So this is why I say that red line, that, first I said it's political. Second, I said it's uh, economical. They needed unskilled labor. So all the workforce was coming from there. This is why you find... A lot of us, whether it's people from the old regions that speak Oshwambo, whether it's the Himbas, the Himbas were even uh, added into the South African military, the, uh, what was it called, South African Defense Force, SDA, back in the day, uh, the Kung Fu guys, they were there. You would find also even some Caprivians were in there, and you'd find a lot of us were even in the mines. And this is why you'd find a lot of Caprivian families and Caprivian people living outside the Zambezi region in areas like combat and so forth, which was actually being discussed, that was actually being spoken about in in the parliament. This is why you find a lot of these people from the old regions are farming, are working this side. It is because of that red line. That's what that red line creates. The third one, which is the modern day one, disease. Diseases will always exist in livestock farming and plant life farming, in any form of farming, diseases will exist. We can't deny the existence of diseases. Even today, we thought, um, we, even today, right now as I speak, we're experiencing a global pandemic. COVID-19 COVID coronavirus happened. So, disease outbreak is another issue. Yes, a disease like foot and mouth is devastating. A disease like animal tuber tuberculosis is devastating. A disease like lumpy skin disease is devastating. A disease like elephant skin disease is devastating. A disease like hoof rot is devastating. A disease like rabies is devastating on the agricultural sector of a country. But... 
the one argument I always say is, I agree that better control methods have to happen for, for the prevention of disease outbreaks in this country. But what I disagree with is literally excluding people because of the argument of a disease. We have controlled diseases over the years. It's not that human beings were not capable. Diseases, diseases have been controlled. Where it was tuberculosis, even right now of COVID-19, we're not yet controlling it, but we are trying to get it under control. Whether it is with HIV and AIDS, whether it is with malaria, we are combating to, to fight it. What is so difficult with controlling illnesses that are passed by animals? It is not like an illness passed by a human being. Human beings, because of our minds, we are very... We are very tricky uh, beings, but animals are easy to control. When a disease outbreak happens in the Zambezi region, 500 Ks from where your crawl is, let's say you are farming in the Ngoma area and there's a disease outbreak, 500 Ks, let's say Linyanti area, an outbreak happens to your foot and mouth. They shut down the entire region, which means when they shut down the entire region, yourself as a farmer sitting 500 Ks from that person where the disease broke out can't even sell your cattle. You can't even sell your cattle. You can't. The abattoir shuts down. Midco automatically shuts down. The private butchery shut down. Literally, there's a, there's, a, there's a restriction on movement of livestock in the entire region, even though you have been spending money to vaccinate your cattle. That's what happens. I always ask, and I always have this debate with officials and also uh, the vets. Is there no other method to try and proper, proper, proper monitor and proper control of animal illnesses. If the UK were ravaged 100 years ago, ravaged a couple of years back by mad cow disease, they brought it under control. Mad cow disease still does happen, but not as much as it used to be back in the day. They've controlled it. How are we as Africans still failing? And I sit down sometimes, call me a conspirator, but I sit down sometimes and I say, this is economical and this is political. This is economical and this is political. Why do I say it's economical? Every time our government starts speaking of we want to remove that red line or we're in the process of slowly but surely removing this red line, suddenly do you see our neighbors in South Africa, our international markets all over the world start threatening to close the markets where our meat ends up. And you sit down and you say, why does this happen? You are telling me that our national meat producer, which is Meatco in this country, the biggest, it's Meatco does not take blood samples from this cattle, test their blood, test the blood to see whether this cow is carrying any, any kind of pathogen or any kind of illness. And I'm sure they do this, they do this, I believe they do this. But yet this, 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 this market's panic. And I ask myself, why is this? Call me a conspirator, but I know of life, I know of meat lobbyists. I know the meat lobbyists. They are there. They exist, even here in Namibia. They are the ones who have the line there to say, hey, uh, they want to remove this red line here, uh, threaten to close the border, so we put pressure on the government not to remove the red line. And this is why the government can't even remove the red line. That's why you'd see, they'll talk about, hey, we want, when the current president, President uh, Hagi Ginko came in, he was talking about, we want to remove the red line because you're having a meat source of 1.3 million heads of cattle up in the communal area. You're having 1.2 million heads of cattle in this area, in the, in, the southern, in the southern side of the veterinary line, where should it make sense? Isn't it that where we have the biggest resource of cattle is where we are supposed to be converting and producing meat from there? But the meat lobbyists, those guys who work behind closed doors, as they would call them, the kingmakers, they prevent this. I've come into arguments even with, and I don't want to be racial, but I've also come into arguments even with some white farmers. I understand the white farmer's point of view. I understand it. He wants to protect his market because this is what he's eating from. Suddenly, if that red line is removed, let's say diseases are brought under control in the next five years, we eliminate foot and mouth, we eliminate all these illnesses in livestock. What's going to happen? If a South African meat buyer comes from South Africa of a truck to come and buy cattle from a farmer in the Khutfontein or the Khobabas area, and these farmers here in the Khutfontein and the Khobabas area are being difficult. No, we want $6 per kilo. And that meat buyer says, you want what? How much again? Say how much you want. Six dollars per kilo. Six dollars per kilo. Okay, fine. You want six dollars per kilo? It's all right. Guys, let's take our trucks. Let's drive up to the Zambezi. Let's drive up to the Kavango. Let's drive up to the north. Let's drive up to the Kunene. You reach there and you offer that people probably three dollars per kilo. 
Those people will say, my brother, my brother, pay me and load. That's what they would say. So it would create, uh, uh, um, it will create, uh, uh, it will create an un imbalancing right now because these guys are enjoying lekker, and I'm saying they're enjoying good prices for cattle right now. Most of them are sending their kids to university just on the back of livestock. Most of them are starting businesses just on the back of livestock. Most of them are living comfortable lives just on the back of livestock. But the people up there who might have more cattle than them are struggling and can't even make ends meet. So when that line is removed, this is where these guys have their eyes to say, Aish, if this line goes, ne, we are going to struggle. We are going to have serious, serious competition because the buyers will just take Botswana through Botswana, Zambia into the Zambezi, load hundreds of cow off. Mitko here, when they come to us as commercial farmers and tell us they want to buy cattle and we want to be difficult. Because right now we have the bargaining chip, we have the bargaining, we have the bargaining ticket in our pocket. Mitko can't go anywhere. If Mitko comes to 10 farmers this side of the this side of the veterinary uh, corridor, if this side of the veterinary line, and tells them, uh, and the farmers say, look, we want $6 per kilogram. Mitko just has to take because they, where are they going to go source this meat? They can't go up to the Zambezi region because the rule is there. It cannot leave. It can't even live when it's dead. It needs to stay that side. The meat that goes to the European and the other exporting uh, markets is usually the meat from the south, uh, southern side of the veterinary. As I said, these are areas like the Grootfontein, Ocho, coming down to the south. The meat from the northern part up, north, Kunene, uh, the Kunene, the O region, the Kavango and the Zambezi region, that meat you would usually... Back in the day, was usually was usually because people considered not good quality meat. It would go to the to our markets like the market in Angola, the Botswana market, the Zambia market, the the smaller markets. But the big the big the big market the big markets get the the meat from the veterinary side. So that is the economical reason. The lobbyists are there; they are fighting, and they will always keep on fighting to keep this red line up because they know, you know. Come on, it's not it's not being stupid when you read out of war. And you, and you notice that these enemies of mine have a bigger army than me. What do you have to do to, do to win this fight? Is by weakening them. How do you weaken them? On their downfalls. This is outbreaks. Because a lot of communal land farmers in that area, some of them, are, I don't want to use this word, but I'll have to use it, are peasant farmers. In terms of they live, they survive of what they, what they produce. Whether they are planting millies, when he sells that millies at the end of the year, maybe in April, that money he makes, that is the money he's going to use to pay uh, his children's tuition or to buy medication for his cattle. So if, he, if his, let's say, his harvest collapses, he didn't sell any white maize or he didn't sell any yellow maize or he didn't sell any mahangu, he will be unable to buy vaccinations to, vaccine, to vaccinate his cattle. Some of these farmers in that area do not have the financial backing to say, I can go to, to Agra, I can go to, I can go to Agra, I can go to Cap Agri, I can go to Furmiester, I can go to Suavet and I can go buy a bottle of Lampivax, which do, a dose which injects 100 cows. That dose that injects 100 cows, by the way, costs 1.5, I think it goes around there. So now this man does not have the money to pay 1.5. His cattle get sick. He either has to wait for a government handout or his, his, his entire crop is going to be decimated by a disease. That's how diseases, this is how diseases spread so quickly within that communal areas because a lot of those guys don't have this money. They have livestock because on the end of the day, being a person of Bantu descendant, it is tradition to keep livestock. I have cattle, but I don't have money. I don't have money to buy a, a vial of vaccine, a va vaccination to vaccine my cattle. And we probably have one or two or three state vets with three buckies for an entire region that has to drive around vaccinating all this cattle. And they take long. By the time they reach your crawl, your entire head, your entire head of cattle are just sick. And the last thing they have to do is to shoot all of them and bury them and burn them. So this is why these things happen. So this is where this lobbyists see it. Like, ah, we got them. We got them on that one. Because number one, there is no Agra there. These people have to either drive from the Zambezi to Rundu. It's about 500 Ks to buy just a vial of medication. I imagine you're driving 500 kilos just to buy a box of medication. Then you have to drive back again. The fuel you are using, the consumption. Number two, I have a job. Probably I'm a teacher, I'm a weekend farmer, or I am a manager in some company. And I can afford to be vaccinating my cattle every year. And I vaccinate. I follow a vaccinating program that has been set out by the state vet of the country. I follow it. And my neighbor is probably unemployed. He's surviving off his farming business. Didn't make a good harvest. Didn't sell any chickens this year. He has to buy medication for his cattle. He's unable to do that. What happens to his cattle? His cattle or goats or sheep, they catch an illness, they all die. 
His cattle being sick start affecting my cattle that are being vaccinated here. Suddenly now we are all condemned. I can't sell my cattle. I can't even take my cattle to, to the open market to go slaughter and create kapana because my neighbor's cattle was sick and now all our cattle are, are condemned in the entire area. Those are the problems. And the meat lobbyists sit down and say, man, 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 man. Forgive me if I'm sounding as a, as a person who loves conspiracies, but they sit down and they say, man, man, let's hit them on that. Let's hit them on their diseases. Let's hit them on their continuous outbreaks. Let's hit them on that. Because of that, the government even themselves will sit down and say, yo, it is not financial, financially intelligent to remove that red line with so many outbreaks of every, every disease. Because at the end of the day, of course, there will be outbreaks because you got wild animals, you got elephants, you got lions, you got buffaloes, you got impalas, you got, you got, you got, you got, uh, what is this? You got impalas, you got water birds, you got all these different wildlife and even domesticated animals that are sharing water points, sharing grazing areas. So, of course, there will be disease outbreaks. There will always be a disease outbreak. But what is stopping, and I've said this with this red line, what is stopping, even right now when you take your cattle to Midco to be slaughtered, your animals are first put into a quarantine holding facility before they are processed into meat. It's not like, yeah, I know when I was still farming in Vertfli, you, uh, you, you would take four or five cows to the Vertfli abattoir. They would stand, sometimes not really stand, sometimes they'll just be processed. Sometimes they stand five days. But there, the cattle will have to go stand in a quarantine facility to show that these animals are sick. Nowadays, the cattle don't even need to stand in a quarantine facility. Nowadays, uh, science has advanced far ahead that now you just pull blood from an animal, you do the various tests on those blood samples, and the blood will tell you the story of the animal. So, if this can be done, what is stopping that red line from being removed? If I, as a farmer, say, man, there's an auction in Khultfontein, I want to take 25 slaughter oxen. I get the permit. Three weeks or four weeks in advance, the people come, the vets come to my crawl, they come pull blood samples of this cattle, or at least the blood samples were pulled of this cattle. They kept in, I, I build a little holding pen for them, I buy feeds, I buy grass bales, I feed them, and they stand there. And the blood samples are taken from this vet. Before my permit is even issued, they test for all known pathogens in livestock. And if my cattle all get a, a green card, a green, a, green, a green tick to say, okay, they're fine, they can be moved, what is stopping that from being done? And saying, okay, Mitchell, your cattle are healthy. You can take your cattle from there, take them to the Grootfontein area, because probably in the Grootfontein area, they appreciate cattle uh, better than the, the farmers up in the Zambezi region. I can make a better price. What is stopping us from doing that? If people say money, fine. We need to invest. Because as I'm saying, the, the state land and the red line are poverty, are creators of poverty traps. It is very sad, and, I speak, and I'm saying it right now, it is very sad when you have to be burying your relatives who have over 300 herd of cattle, like poor people. It's just that some of us are fortunate that we are employed, that we can all take out and contribute 100, 100, 100, 100, at least to, to be able to buy our seniors' caskets. If we were all unemployed and you didn't work, we'd have to bury them in homemade uh, caskets or we'd have to put them in blankets and bury them, like how it was done in the olden days. What is stopping this government from doing that? Let's put aside the, 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 the racial politics. Let's just talk on the basic of human nature here. You're having people, and I've said this, and a lot of, of my people on that side, every time I engage with them, always tell me, Mitchell, if you're able to get, all of them tell you, yeah, you know, here in this community, I'm just farming because of my father. But my biggest plan is to have enough cattle. When Mitko opens up, I sell all my cattle, I get money, I'm able to go buy myself a commercial farm so I can move to the land. They even call this side, they call this side of the veterinary, uh, veterinary corridor, they call it the land of milk and honey. Because this is where prosperity happens. Up there, there's, 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 there's no prosperity. There's just poverty. So what is stopping this government from saying, let's implement this. Let's create a situation whereby the vets travel every second month, before outbreaks happen, every second month, to every crawl, every crawl, every crawl within a particular region, whether it's the Kabango, the Caprivi, the O region, or the Opu, or, I mean, the Kunene region. What is stopping the vets from doing that? from going to each and every various crawl at different times just to pull blood samples from each crawl to test if there's an outbreak. What is stopping this government from doing that? If, if countries like the United States of America today, and I'm speaking because I, I did my research, say that they defeated foot and mouth disease 100 years ago in their country, 
the UK were able to defeat uh, medical disease 100 years ago in their country. What is stopping us from stopping it? I know people will say, Mitchell, but they are free-moving free wildlife, buffaloes and what, what, what. Fine. We can Fine. On the end of the day, we also do not want to come disturb uh, natural uh, migrating patterns of wildlife. But what is stopping us to say, okay, there are buffaloes in this area, farmers in this area where the buffaloes are very, are, are, are very constant. Why can't we, these farmers, have to subject their cattle to monthly uh, tests to see if they're carrying any foot and mouth? What is stopping them from doing that? For me, this red line is, is creating a poverty trap. The red line and, and, and state-owned land are creating poverty traps. Number two, it's creating a lazy, forgive me for saying this, but it's creating lazy government uh, uh, agencies and lazy, minister, every, and lazy ministerials and, and lazy various ministries because this is what they're supposed to be doing. Why do they have to be reactive and not proactive? This is what's happening in those communal areas. And that is the reason why I feel this red line should be removed. It can't continue being that we are 31 years with independence coming now, but we're still 30 years. 30 years of independence. And we still have everyday Namibians who have enough livestock, whether it's goats, sheep, cattle, chickens, are still struggling to make ends meet, are living from foot to mouth. It is not fair. I feel it is unfair and it is something that needs to be corrected. It's some of these injustices of the past that need to be fixed. And this is why I advocate and I continuously I understand the risks of removing this red line. But I am saying there are methods in removing this red line, making sure that the markets are protected. Because I know there is an African saying that goes, if a child does not feel the love and warmth of a village, that same child will burn down the village in order to feel its warmth. And that is the way things are going. I'm, I speak to a lot of them. I speak to them privately. I speak to them on the various agricultural groups I'm with. A lot of them mentioned my brother were getting tired. A lot of those uh, gentlemen on that other side of the veterinary line who live in the land of milk and honey and prosperity, I am speaking from point of privileges. We here, we are struggling. We are suffering. Imagine I have a cow. I have to drive the entire uh, Zambezi region just to find someone to buy my cow. If the red line was not there, I could have just taken this five or six, taken them to, to an auction and the South African feedlot guys would buy them. So it is a problem. I understand the risks of diseases. I have mentioned that I've understand the collapsing that they, that, that, that they can do. But I believe there are ways in which we can work to mitigate and limit the destruction a disease outbreak like foot and mouth, lumpy skin, elephant skin disease can cause in an area. They are. It's not they aren't. They, they are. Other countries have done it. Come on. If the United States of America, I know people be like in the comments, like, Mitchell, but America is a first world country. They were fighting with the, this disease. They eradicated it. Cat, uh, cat, uh, uh, cattle mad cow disease in the UK, they were fighting with it. They defeated it. What is stopping African countries such as ourselves, from fighting this disease like foot and mouth, lumpy skin, elephant skin, all these other variants of diseases that we know are common in our area. What is stopping us from fighting and defeating them? For me, it's a situation of, as I said, political, economical, historical. On the economical basis, other, other, people, other people are suffering from this red line, other people are benefiting handsomely from this red line. It's unfortunate. That is the way the world is set up. But I would love to one day live to see this red line finally being removed and a plan, a, con a contingency plan drawn up on how we will remove the red line. We will limit the state-owned land and give people ownership of this pieces of uh, agricultural plow land, pieces of this land they sit on. Because unfortunately, as it stands, not every individual in Namibia will be able to one day buy a commercial, a commercialized private, uh, private piece, private property. Not everybody will be able to do that. Some of us will have to make due of what we have in our communal areas and we'll have to survive on that. You know, I know a lot of people, I know a lot of people watch this video and say, but Mitchell, farmers up in the northern areas are spoiled. They just get government handouts. The reason for that is because, my chief, number one, we don't own the land. Number two, there's a red line. How are we supposed to live if I'm not even making one dollar, if I'm not even making a thousand dollars of my livestock yearly? How am I supposed to live? That's my two cents on that farmer's corner. I, uh, pre uh, once again, I want to say thank you to the members that um, comment, like, subscribe, and share the videos. And uh, I appreciate everybody who takes the time to watch these videos and 
give their opinions as I'm growing. As I said, I'm trying to grow a community here where we can speak on agricultural things. Sooner or later, I'm going to start hosting interviews here with various farmers from fish, from agriculture farmers, uh, guys who are running a pig, who are doing uh, chicken farming, pigs, livestock, horticulture, various forms of horticulture. We're working towards that. So thank, once again, guys, thank you very much and uh, have yourself a good Wednesday.